Good evening. My name is Patrick Lewis, and I'm the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you joined us tonight. Now, I'm happy to introduce tonight's speaker, Gwen Potts. Gwen is a former Executive Director of William Cron's Locust Grove, a National Historic Landmark nominated in recognition of the site's Clark Associations. A former Historic Locust Grove, Inc. board chair, she also served as CEO of the Blackacre State Nature Conservancy and taught history in Louisville and Atlanta public schools. She's a member of Kentucky's Society of the National Society of Colonial Dames, which is the owner of Senator John Brown's Liberty Hall in Frankfurt. Now I'm happy to turn the program over to Gwen and then rejoin her after the presentation to moderate questions as time permits. Thank you, Patrick. And hello, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's program. My book has been described by some reviewers as a double biography that uses the American Revolution and Kentucky settlement as its primary settings. I think of it more as chronicle, although I certainly use the life experiences of George Rogers Clark and William Cron to put faces on the events surrounding the revolution and Ohio River Valley settlement. But the story also is populated with natives whose cultural collapse formed the counterbalance to the American presence and with enslaved men and women who had no choice but to join the events that concluded with the establishment of the United States. Clark and Cron are at the center of the story chiefly because I've spent 35 years researching their lives and telling their stories and so I tend to look at this period of American history from their perspectives. Scott, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. The degree to which George Rogers Clark was isolated and overstretched during the revolution invites few comparisons in American history. And his post-war command in the West was simply unique. Clark's work there has been compared to that of Washington's in the East, but Washington, although he was taxed beyond his resources, survived the revolution surrounded by a coterie of admirers, a frequently disagreeable but unified Continental Army officer corps that enjoyed regular periods of downtime, a concept that was unknown to Clark. Major William Cron was among that International Corps of Officers. He spent four of the revolution's seven years in Washington's company. He was the revolution of history books and textbooks. In other words, his revolution was nothing like Clark's revolution. Clark and Cron died under the same roof. It was William Cron's house located about six miles from the falls overlooking the Ohio River. The place is called Locust Grove, and in its year, early years, the house was filled with Democratic Republicans. Washington was their hero, but Jefferson was their demigod. And chief among the Jeffersonians were George Rogers Clark and his youngest brother, William, who by any standard lived their lives out loud. Unlike the Clarks, Cron played his cards close to his chest. He was like a shark. He lived his life always edging forward, always succeeding. Cron might truly have been a Washington Federalist who simply, if improbably, ended up in the company of uh, some very independent Westerners, or he might have been an unreconstructed Irishman who was happy at home with political turmoil and international intrigue. After all these years with the man, I still don't know. Either way, I think the coexistence of the Virginia Clarks and the Irish Crons is an inviting metaphor for both the revolution and this area's settlement. And for the record, before we get started, this is not a romantic novel and it's not a hagiographic uh, book. It's populated with people who owned men women and children who worked to displace or annihilate original human beings, who generally cared for women but seldom were inconvenienced by them, men who risked their lives for independence from Great Britain yet were willing to leave their newly created nation behind within the same decade. The world 
George Rogers Clark and William Cron occupied was frightening. It was bloody and it was complicated. And the people who survived it, native, African or European in origin were remarkably adaptable, both physically and emotionally. I began writing this book in 2016. And as time went on, I became increasingly interested in exploring the degree to which historical forces driving these figures continue to drive thought and behavior in today's world. Was Kentucky's initial reluctance to accept the federal constitution a consequence of independent Scots-Irish thought dominating the population? Was it the influence of one chubby, ebullient canaver named James Wilkinson? Or was it a predictable reaction to Jay's agreement to allow Spain to close the Mississippi River in favor of East Coast trading packs? Could it just have been the inevitable result of Kentucky's distance from the source of legal and political authority? Kentucky's resistance to federalism probably was motivated by all those incentives, but the most decisive may have been physical and psychological distance. And if distance separates the people from their capital, it serves the same purpose in causing the capital to forget its distant people. Major William Cron's uncle had been a colonial deputy Indian supervisor who worked for the crown under Sir William Johnson. This is Sir William Johnson. There is no image that we know of, of Cron's uncle. Johnson was Cron's most important friend and supporter. And throughout the 1750s and 60s, Johnson sent the elder Cron into Pennsylvania and the Ohio River Valley to weaken French influence among the Western natives and broker agreements with the same American Indians for Britain. There wasn't a British colonist who understood pre-revolutionary native cultures and behavior better than Colonel George Cron. In 1752, Colonel Cron wrote to the colonial governor of Pennsylvania to explain that distance had altered the previously compliant Ohio Iroquois natives lessening their fear of retribution from their governing council, which was located in upstate New York. Cron wrote, the British government may have what opinion they will of the Ohio Indians and think the Indians are obliged to do what the Onondaga council will bid them. But I assure your honor, they will act for themselves without consulting the council. 35 years later, Harry Ennis, Kentucky's first district court judge and a Clark cousin wrote to the Virginia governor about the mood in Kentucky. He said, I am of the opinion that this Western country will in a few years revolt from the union and endeavor to raise an independent government. This was 1787. Different peoples, different correspondents, different governors. But isn't Cron's and Ennis's message the same? Cron warns of American Indian insurrection. Ennis warns of Kentucky's insurrection. And this was the post-revolutionary environment in which Clark and Cron lived. I'm not going to talk about Clark's mad swamp dash to Vincennes tonight or Cron's frozen crossing of the Delaware River with Washington. If you're tuning into this talk, I'm fairly certain you're familiar with both those things. If not, please read the book. But in light of the events we're living through in light of this particular week, let's talk instead about consequences. But we'll begin in 1776 when everything still seemed possible. The men who introduced the American Revolution had three overwhelming challenges. One, to win, or at least to bring to a negotiated peace in which Washington survived, a military conquest against what might have been the best outfitted army in Europe. Secondly, to persuade Eastern colonists who 
comprised most of America's population, that their cause not only was justifiable, but winnable. And lastly, to convince the otherwise disenfranchised population who live near or even beyond the Appalachian Mountains to participate in this rebellion as Americans. The first two objectives were clear. The revolution began as a binary event for most colonists. They either saw the benefit of independence and were willing to support it, or they did not. But the third objective was more difficult to wrap their heads around because very few of those men gathered in Philadelphia knew or wanted to know anything about the people who chose to live farther west than Monticello. As it turns out, this worked just fine for Virginia's first Commonwealth governor, Patrick Henry. He used his time at the beginning of the war to establish his own revolutionary agenda by becoming not only the Commonwealth's governor, but its Secretary of State, its Secretary of War, and its Secretary of Commerce. He established a diplomatic relationship between Virginia and Spanish officials in New Orleans and promised military support should the British Navy invade Louisiana, which they intended to do. In return, he secured Spanish support in the form of supplies, uniforms, and spies for Virginia troops who just might be sent west. Henry, therefore, had developed dual strategies through which he would address a single objective, which was to claim the land between the Southern Great Lakes and Kentucky for Virginia in the vacuum of any organized government control in the territory. Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry didn't particularly like one another for a lot of reasons, but they did later agree to one thing, that on the eve of his 25th birthday, George Rogers Clark came to Williamsburg to propose a Western campaign into the lower Ohio River Valley that he dreamed would end with the capture of the British fort at Detroit. When he was still an adolescent, Clark had begun to use his surveying skills to associate himself with lucrative Western land opportunities. He was after all a surveyor for the Ohio company. He was not a revolutionary by nature or inclination. And in fact, it's been referred to as an accidental soldier. And although Henry and Jefferson later wrote that it was Clark who initiated the Illinois campaign, Clark himself wrote otherwise in 1779. Either way, clearly, Patrick Henry and the Virginia legislature meant to use the opportunity of revolution to claim what was then known as the Northwest Territory. And it is immaterial whether the campaign's young leader was recruited for the job or if he initiated the campaign. It could not have happened without the Virginia legislature's approval. Clark's agreement to establish Virginia's flag on the Mississippi River created a permanent menace for British plans emanating from both Detroit and London. And at the conclusion of the revolution, it made negotiation for the Northwest unnecessary. I wrote that the differences between the revolutions carried out on the Atlantic coast and in the Ohio River Valley were so great that many supporters of either sector appear from time to time to forget the other existed. In fact, the two theaters operated somewhat ambiguously, one under the directive and the financial control of the Continental Congress. After all, they offered Washington little else and at that they didn't do that very well and the other by the governor of Virginia. That it worked cohesively at any level was the consequence of Washington's Virginia roots. That allowed Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson to communicate freely with the commander in chief with little regard to Congress. So while George Rogers Clark was adjusting to the roles of military and civilian commander in the Northwest Territory, William Cron was enduring an entirely different revolution. As Clark was floating down the Ohio about to found Louisville and capture Kaskaskia and Cahokia and Vincennes twice, 
William Cron was camped at Valley Forge with most of the Continental Army. Cron rode with Washington from New York to Philadelphia and back to New York again before being sent south, where he joined more than 3,000 Americans in surrendering Charleston in 1780, becoming prisoners of war. He did witness Cornwallis's surrender the next year, but after his infamous uncle's 1782 death, he was left entirely on his own to establish a post-revolutionary career. Cron was fortunate though. He had an unerring ability to prove himself useful to people of importance. And this characteristic served him well throughout his life. If we look at this map, you'll see the area in pink is France's proposal in 1782 for what North America would look like after the Revolutionary War ended. By then, of course, Cornwallis had surrendered. We all knew who was going to win. The area in green would be the new United States of America. Yellow is Spain. And the part in between there is no man's land. It's up for grabs. But keep in mind what France thought was going to be a, a reasonable solution for them. This, of course, would indicate that they had essentially retaken the land that they had lost in the 1763 Treaty of Paris. So let's look at the next slide and see what the map of North America actually looked like in the 1783 Treaty of Paris. As I said earlier, all of that green up there that became Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin has been put at the feet of George Rogers Clark. France did not get any of that. And in fact, France essentially was reduced to uh, almost nothing. The Brits held on to what uh, was today, is today Canada. And look at all that Spain controlled. So this was what the United States looked like at the end of the revolution. Now, just days before he had left for war, William Cron up in Pittsburgh had purchased 6,424 acres from his uncle just southwest of Fort Pitt. I'm going to say that again, 6,424 acres. If you have ever taken off or landed at Pittsburgh International Airport, you were on William Cron's land. He planned to farm this land, of course, and he thought also he was obviously going to earn a lot of income through the sale of a lot of it. Unfortunately, his deed was filed through Virginia because Virginia claimed the Pittsburgh area before the revolution, but then of course ceded it to the federal government afterwards. So by 1783, it was understood that the territory would be awarded to Pennsylvania. Cron wrote to his benefactor, Philadelphia merchant Barnard Gratz, to sound an alarm. The agreed boundary between Pennsylvania and Virginia is run by which the whole of Colonel Cron's grants are taken into Pennsylvania. How are we to get them again from Pennsylvania? The answer, of course, was they would not. So at the conclusion of the revolution, William Cron, by then a former Virginia Continental officer, and George Rogers Clark, still employed as Virginia's Western military commander, were hired by Virginia as the Commonwealth's senior deputy and principal surveyors for its state line, which was its militia veterans. They moved to the falls in the summer of 1784, and they set up shop on what became Louisville's Main Street. And although Clark soon was called by Jefferson and Washington to go to New York to work as a federal Indian negotiator, Cron stayed in Louisville, distributing land in Kentucky and Ohio for more than two decades to revolutionary militia soldiers and, and their officers. He soon took Clark's surveying title, and in 1789, he married Clark's sister, Lucy. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking mm, she must have had a great personality and made her own clothes. But in reality, she looks just like her brothers. She's a Clark. And I'm gonna blame a little bit on, on the artist who has um, 
thank goodness, remained anonymous, at least for two centuries. So this is Lucy and William at the, near the time of their marriage. The couple built an estate on the River Bluff, albeit through the labor of a sizable enslaved workforce and created a large family on the prosperous farm that eventually amounted to almost 700 acres, something that would have been impossible in Cron's native Dublin. So while Cron went about the business of establishing his seat near Louisville, Clark didn't even mean to stay in town. He wrote his brother, General Jonathan Clark, in 1788 to say he planned to, quote, sell out as fast as I can, except particular tracts. And to underscore his determination, he wrote the Spanish government in New Orleans with an offer to establish a colony of Western settlers on the west bank of the Mississippi. His terms with Spain were characteristically brief. The man was terse. He would become a Spanish citizen, and he saw himself as the colony's governor who would administer justice with an elected council. Each head of household would receive 1,000 acres, and they were, quote, not to be disturbed as to their religion. Remember, Spain was essentially a monolithically Catholic nation, and uh, these settlers were not. Spain said no thanks, just as they declined similar offers from Friedrich von Steuben, Daniel Boone, John Sevier, and others because they already had an American who had agreed to establish pro-Spanish colonies on the Mississippi and act as a spy for them. Agent 13, if you can believe that. Believe it because it's true. This man, of course, was General James Wilkinson, who leads us to another post-revolutionary saga. There he is. George Rogers Clark's parents and his younger siblings had settled in Louisville on the Poplar level in 1785. Mulberry Hill was where General William Clark grew to manhood and where George Rogers Clark took shelter when at the age of 34, it appeared his career and maybe his life were coming to an end. Mulberry Hill also was where Cron courted Lucy and where Colonel Richard Clough Anderson, Virginia's principal surveyor for its Continental Army uh, veterans, courted Lucy's sister, Elizabeth. And no doubt it was where Irish adventurer and quasi-physician James O'Fallon courted and married youngest Clark daughter, Fanny. O'Fallon later claimed to the King of Spain that he was of Spanish heritage. The King eventually ordered his arrest, not for that reason, but for many other reasons. But in truth, O'Fallon was born in County Roscommon, Ireland. He attended the University of Edinburgh from which he did not graduate and he arrived in North Carolina in 1774 to become an ardent revolutionary. He was a friend of Thomas Paine, and so he made important connections in both Philadelphia and in Paris. But after the revolution, O'Fallon became disillusioned with the American government and offered himself as a Spanish subject in West Florida, willing to create a Catholic colony. He hired James Wilkinson to lead the expedition, initially unaware that Wilkinson already was on Spain's payroll and that Wilkinson probably accepted the job only as a way of keeping internal tabs on the project for Spain. O'Fallon's ego apparently knew no bounds. And in 1790, he informed the Spanish governor that his plans for creating the colony from among the members of the various Yazoo land companies he represented, that's a whole other story altogether, but worth telling, were about to become reality. He wrote this to the governor. Through my persuasion and influence, the members of the general company, all dissatisfied with the present federal government, have immediately and spontaneously fallen in with my plan. And without their suspecting what I was aiming at, I led them to consent to become the slaves of Spain. 
He's quite a guy. He married Fanny Clark six months after writing this letter. That was February 1791. But by then he had experienced a public split with Wilkinson, who wrote that O'Fallon was, quote, destitute of sincerity. Now that doesn't sound very harsh today, but it, in 1790, those were fighting words. In reality, this is what happened. Wilkinson had discovered that O'Fallon had learned of Wilkinson's role as a Spanish secret agent. And Wilkinson was trying to get ahead of O'Fallon's inevitable distribution of this news. O'Fallon did indeed write George Washington, tell him of, telling him of Wilkinson's quote, treason. And Washington had O'Fallon's letter read on the floor of the United States Senate. By the time he had married Fanny, O'Fallon had convinced George Rogers Clark to take Wilkinson's position. But Clark's opinion of the project is moot. Washington and the US Senate chose to focus on O'Fallon's activities rather than Wilkinson's. This was the beginning of a long series of events just like that. And the president published an announcement in the Kentucky Gazette warning Kentuckians to stay away from O'Fallon's colonization plans. So while the Yazoo Company fell into limbo, O'Fallon penned a series of letters that were signed as George Rogers Clark, written undoubtedly with Clark's knowledge and approval. The letters offered Clark to France as a mercenary military leader who would command an army of Westerners, mostly Kentuckians, but I'm sure some Tennesseans, whose ultimate goal was to force Spain to open the Mississippi River to American ships. France's ultimate goal, of course, was to recapture the American territory lost in the 1763 Treaty of Paris. Whether or not that bothered uh, O'Fallon or Clark or any of the other men who were involved in this, I don't know. O'Fallon's writing was like the man. It was pretentious, it was verbose, it was full of swagger, but somewhat incredibly, Thomas Paine responded. And in a letter that reached Mulberry Hill in 1793, Paine informed O'Fallon and Clark that the revolutionary French government was considering Clark's offer, in part because of Thomas Jefferson's warm endorsement. And yes, Jefferson's resignation as Secretary of State would not be accepted until December of that year. So Thomas Jefferson offered his warm endorsement as the United States Secretary of State. Although Clark's relationship with O'Fallon fell apart as O'Fallon's marriage to Fanny failed, which led, by the way, the Spanish spies to write that Clark could clobber O'Fallon over the head with his cane in a Louisville tavern, probably true. O'Fallon's introduction of Clark to France had a lingering and a somewhat startling effect. In October 1793, French botanist Andre Michaud arrived in Louisville with letters of introduction for Clark from Jefferson and John Brown, one of Kentucky's first to United States senators. The letters identified Michaud as a man of science about to make a westward trip to study plants. That was true. But new French ambassador Edmond Charles Genet, whom you see here, known to most of us as Citizen Genet, already had written Clark in July offering him a job. Janae's July 12th letter stated in part that, quote, it is time that the free Americans of the West are liberated from the enemy, that would be Spain. It is in you, General, that the direction of this honorable mission has been vested, and you will be able to cover yourself with glory. And this is where it gets good. The citizen Michaud will be in charge of the administration of this affair. Michelle's going to be a busy fellow. Citizen Michelle will also hand over to you your commission as commander in chief of the independent and revolutionary army of the Mississippi. 
Clark had been uncertain of his response until Michelle assured him that, quote, Monsieur Brown was very much informed of our affairs and desired it could be affected. All Michelle was waiting for was promised money from Lexington merchants. James Wilkinson would become the commanding general of the United States Army in 1796, but in 1793, he was working overtime for the Spanish government while at the same time providing Americans with similar, somewhat skewed information. So Washington and Spain were keenly aware of the proposed French campaign Everybody west of the Appalachians was keenly aware of the proposed French campaign. The president acted quickly to defuse any anti-Spain activity emanating from its Western territory because Washington understood the United States could not survive a war with Spain. Washington's Neutrality Act probably saved the country. Jefferson, an avowed Francophile was much more deeply involved with Genet's schemes than Washington chose to prove. But at the president's direction, he wrote Kentucky's governor, Isaac Shelby, in August 1793 to warn that the administration would mobilize troops to stop the French campaign. Jefferson wrote, Spain has complained to the president that certain persons are taking measures to excite the inhabitants of Kentucky against Spanish dominions. If you have reason to believe any such enterprise, put them on guard against the consequences. You'll note that Jefferson was not so much threatening action as he was warning friends. But by this time, John Montgomery, Clark's old Illinois regiment officer, was raising hundreds of men from his Clarksville, Tennessee base. And 50-year-old Benjamin Logan wrote Clark from Shelbyville to say this, quote, it appears to be the general opinion that the interest of this country requires that a spirited enterprise be undertaken against the Spanish posts on the Mississippi. I have once more offered my feeble aid, knowing you are honored with a commission from the minister of France. Again, everybody knew it. And that you are to be at the head of the business. I have taken leave of appointments in the United States. And I do presume I am at liberty to go to any foreign country I please. And I intend to do so. Clark now informed Janae of his decision to leave the country, but he noted he would, quote, guard against doing anything that would injure the United States or give offense to their government. Guard against injuring or offending their government. Clearly, Clark, Logan, Montgomery, and the hundreds of men who followed them considered their new American citizenship to be um, non-compulsory. But none of them intended to attack or in any way they understood harm the new government of the United States. Clark's army was not en route to Philadelphia, but to the Mississippi River because Kentuckians needed access to a seaport and New Orleans was the nearest, easiest port of call. They wanted to bargain, coerce, hassle, whatever it took. They wanted to get Spain to open the Mississippi. And the camp they set up in Western Kentucky was in US territory, but it was not in the state of Kentucky. We all remember the Jackson Purchase. We didn't buy that part of Kentucky until 1818. And this was 1793. They were in that no man's land. Clark's enemies and some modern revisionists look to this moment as traitorous. I respectfully disagree. And I think Governor Shelby's response to Jefferson and therefore to Washington seems to echo my thought 
uh, and much more importantly, express the sentiment of the West. He wrote this, if it is lawful for any one citizen of the state to leave it, it is equally so for any number of them to do so. Clark had been moving in and out of the United States for two decades by crossing one river or one mountain range or another without giving it a thought. Physical, emotional, social, economic distance from authority. Did this independent thought begin when the Ohio Miamis decided to chuck New York Onondaga authority? Or when the folk in Massachusetts decided they couldn't care less about the crown's tea? I don't know. And what about today? The pro-France movement wasn't entirely limited to the West. John Adams was so skittish about the popular movement in Philadelphia that he later opined it was only the 1793 yellow fever epidemic that held the Republic together. In other words, the hostile mobs assembling outside the homes of George Washington and Adams and other government officials dispersed rather than chance a yellow fever death contacted from hanging around with the mob, which seems like good advice then and now. The fever declined as winter set in, of course it was mosquito born, and in the West, the 1794 Battle of Fallen Timbers drew Clark's volunteers away from the Mississippi and ultimately ensured a long hiatus in native settler warfare. And finally, in 1795, Spain agreed to open the lower Mississippi to American ships, which eased economic hardships in Kentucky. The French campaign slipped into history Ben Logan returned to his Shelby County farm and even Janae, who'd been ousted by yet another French revolutionary government uh, and was afraid to return to Paris, married a daughter of a New York governor and became a Hudson River Valley farmer. The French Revolution eventually crumbled under Napoleon's rule, of course, and an argument can be made that with its collapse, all rewards and initiatives connected to it also disappeared. An argument can be made. Clark now fell into what might have been the nadir of his life. When France sent officer spy, and that's one word, officer spy, Georges-Henri Victor Collot to map the Ohio and Mississippi rivers in preparation for future Spanish conflicts with France, Collot came to Louisville in the spring of 1796. He was eager to meet the man he described as, quote, the great military talent who had gained from the natives almost the whole of that immense country that now forms the Western states, the rival, in short, of General Washington. What he encountered left him deeply saddened. He went on, about seven in the evening, we perceived in the middle of the square a number of persons who were crowding around something that lay extended on the ground, on which a blanket had been thrown and which a man was about to take up and carry off. I asked the man, who appeared to be a shoemaker, what was the matter? Do you not see, sir? It is that hero, that great man. He has forgotten at this moment the important services he has rendered us, but it is our duty to remember them. I cover him thus to preserve him from the contempt of the people. George Rogers Clark, dead drunk in Louisville's public square. Two years later, Clark traveled to Philadelphia to settle his account with the new French ambassador. By this reckoning, by his reckoning, France owed him almost $5,000. He had it certified. Shortly after entering the capital, he was arrested by federal agents, or as Clark described them, quote, an English faction which seized the reins of government. John Adams had been elected president who in the West could have seen that coming? Clark was threatened with prison if he refused to surrender his position with the French army, or as he wrote, quote, 
I was invited to give my resignation to the Consul General of France or to retire from the United States. I refuse to do the former, but I believe I shall be obliged to subscribe to the second proposition. The 45-year-old Clark found his way out of Philadelphia and as he wrote, quote, the president of the United States gave the order to have me arrested, but the detachment he sent to take me was attacked and disarmed by a certain number of men, volunteers, that my old comrades had the time to assemble. I then withdrew to the west bank of the Mississippi. I'm not gonna take the time here to wonder about the sudden assemblage on the Ohio River of old comrades who intercepted and did we know not what to a federal force dispatched by the president of the United States. But the upshot is this, Clark fled the United States and he remained in Spanish territory as a fugitive, at least through the conclusion of 1798. With whom he lived, with whom he dined, with whom he survived, I do not know but it seems apparent that he had friends who were expecting him. By the beginning of the 19th century, George Rogers Clark had returned to Louisville to Mulberry Hill. John Adams lost his reelection to, uh, to uh, Thomas Jefferson, so all was right with the world. Clark's parents were dead and William Clark sold his inheritance to move to the Indiana side of the river to his brother's revolutionary land grant where he and George Rogers built a rather rudimentary little settlement, Clarksville. William of course would burst onto the international scene in 1803 when Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis and him west into the unknown. But George Rogers fortunes remained unclear. Given the opportunities of geographic and economic security, Clark might well have spent his life as an avocational engineer or botanist. And Cron, well, Cron would have done exactly what Cron did, marry well, own an impressive piece of property and build a classical library. But located as he was in 1803, alone except for his small but long-standing enslaved household, and with little to do beyond considering the Ohio Falls that lay in front of him, George Rogers Clark opted to form a canal company. Why not? And William Cron once again was at his side. The Indiana Canal Company Board of Directors included besides Clark and Cron, Kentucky Senator John Brown, Revolutionary War veteran and Ohio Senator Jonathan Dayton, we've all heard of Dayton, Ohio. Marston Clark, Davis Floyd, and John Guasme. This was a formidable group. And just to prove the point, in August 1804, they received a charter from the Indiana Territory and $120,000 in startup funds. They were legit. This was going to be the thing that finally secured George Rogers Clark's financial future. And then in May, 1805, Aaron Burr came to town on the first of two Ohio and Mississippi River explorations that may or may not have had a planned military invasion of Mexico as their genesis. Uh, one reviewer of my book has suggested that I spent rather too much time on Mr. Burr, but again, I'm gonna disagree because on its surface, the Burr visit to both Clark's house and Locust Grove is simply interesting. William Cron and Aaron Burr had fought the first half of the revolution together. They had spent Valley Forge together. They were well acquainted. Cron's cousin, Susanna, had married the nephew of Burr's wife's first husband. And as Burr put it, the families were amalgamated. And by the way, Cron's other cousin, the half sister of Susanna, was the wife of Mohawk chief, Joseph Brandt, who was a British soldier, a British officer, and spent most of the revolution hunting George Rogers Clark, no doubt to kill him. Burr was a former US Senator and vice president 
And the fact that he had shot and killed Alexander Hamilton 10 months earlier only increased his status in the American West. Aaron Burr was a star. Also, the comparisons between the trans-Mississippi aspirations of Clark and Burr seem inescapable. And for that matter, the failure of Steuben or Boone to do perhaps, perhaps, what Clark or Burr hoped to achieve or what Austin and Houston would achieve within three decades as heroes, I think deserves some attention. And finally, within the context of this story, the Burr connection is important because it brought an end to George Rogers Clark's last hope for the restoration of his former status. The Canal Company directors invited Burr to join their board, assuming, I suppose, that Burr's name would add prestige to the already heady group of investors. But newspapers throughout the country maintained two headline stories for the next 18 months. One, of course, the Lewis and Clark expedition. And secondly, Aaron Burr's treason. Burr, of course, was tried both in Frankfort and in Richmond, Virginia, and acquitted in both cases, even though Jefferson had pronounced him guilty before either trial began. And although there was never an official investigation into the possible collusion between the Canal Company directors and Burr, the Burr connection to the company was well known. Did all the Indiana Canal Company directors understand why Burr wanted a canal built around the falls of the Ohio? Certainly Dayton did, he was arrested and tried. But what about Clark? What about Cron? What about Brown? The association doomed the company primarily for political reasons. After the election of 1800, Burr had risen to Hamilton's level in terms of receiving Jefferson's personal contempt. And remember that in Kentucky, Washington was a hero, but Jefferson was a demigod. If the Clarks and John Brown had to make a choice between supporting Jefferson or Burr, they were Jefferson's men, and so was the vast majority of the region. As soon as Jefferson made his thoughts known about the Burr expedition, the Indiana Canal Company directors would have backed away. Shortly thereafter, Clark suffered a stroke and the subsequent amputation of his right leg. This resulted in his permanent move to Locust Grove where he lived the remainder of his life and was buried among the Cron family in 1818. He enjoyed the restoration of his reputation in his later years and although the family wouldn't succeed in recapturing more than $30,000 owed him by Virginia until after his death, the community and the nation mourned the loss of their Hannibal of the West. William Cron followed Clark to the same family cemetery in 1822, when the Washington Intelligencer reported that, quote, during the whole of that memorable conflict, which resulted in the dismemberment of one and the creation of another empire, Cron discharged the duties of an ardent and gallant officer in the dangers as well as the glories of that eventful period. In the end, Irish immigrant William Cron flourished on the frontier of the United States of America. George Rogers Clark, who it can be argued secured that frontier never adapted to the country he helped create. I hadn't wanted the words Locust Grove in the title of this book. I thought the addition of the Cron home suggested a small and possibly unimportant book scope, but actually I'm happy now that, uh, that it's included. By the way, I don't think we've mentioned the title is George Rogers Clark and William Cron. 
the story of revolution settlement and the early years of Locust Grove. <laughs> I probably should have mentioned that at the top. At any point, the addition of the Cron home allows me to augment the book narrative to the degree that I could explain that the second Cron generation did what the first would not do, emancipate the farms and the caves enslaved human beings. It also gave me the opportunity to uh, explain the family's acquisition and development of Mammoth Cave as a tourist attraction. The legal mechanics involved in the process of emancipation provided us with the names of every enslaved person who survived to freedom and family letters, uh, public documents, uh, ongoing research have unveiled much about the conditions in which Locust Grove's enslaved residents lived. So we now know that uh, internationally known cave guide, Stephen Bishop, whom you see here, married Locust Grove's cook, Charlotte Brown. And that Ellen, Wesley, and Charles were the children of Alfred and his wife, Hannah. And we know so much more. Slavery and its outcome is a continuing thread that runs from this and many other post-revolutionary era settlements right up to today. And if it is our choice to speak or to write about the Clarks or the Crons or their era, it is our responsibility to tell the story of the enslaved people who lived with them. Finally, Locust Grove represents an all too familiar pattern in American history. It begins with victory over the hardships associated with taming a wilderness and banishing an enemy culture that witnessed its own destruction. It's followed by the appearance of a second generation who lived largely from the bounty of the first. And it concludes with a third generation who essentially lost it all. In this way, Locust Grove becomes the last standing character in the story. Today, it's where the unlikely tale of immigrant success is celebrated. It's where the incomparable exploits of the extended Clark family continue to be interpreted. It's where the experiences of Stephen, Charlotte, and all the other enslaved pioneers continue to be understood and it's where Mohawk, Joseph Brandt, and Miami, Little Turtle, and Mandan, Sheheki, were once known as contemporaries. Thank you for inviting me to join you tonight. And if you have some questions, I'll be happy to try to help. Thanks so much, Gwen. I, I know we really enjoyed that. We do have some questions lined up, so we'll jump right in. Um, how old was George Rogers Clark when, uh, when William and Mary Weather Lewis went to the Pacific and, and what did he know about that expedition? Uh, he was uh, uh, 52 and uh, the question is, is funny only because um, un incredibly, uh, many people come to Locust Grove and want to know how old George Rogers Clark was when he went to the Pacific with Meriwether Lewis, not knowing it was his younger brother. Two Northwest territories in one family unit is very difficult for people to put their heads around. Yeah. So uh, uh, he was 52, and but uh, Jefferson had asked him back in uh, the mid 1780s if Clark would entertain uh, a trip like that. Clark said no only because he needed to make some money. And he knew, he knew Jefferson didn't have enough money to make it worth his while. And, and speaking of, we've got another question about, um, could you kind of describe the extent of, of Clark's land holdings in Kentucky and, and across the river? And then also go into a little bit more about Cron and, and their ownership of Mammoth Cave. Sure. Uh, Clark owned about 73,000 acres in far western Kentucky. It was in the purchase, so during his lifetime, uh, he couldn't develop it. Uh, but he did acquire it, and uh, it, the family, of course, did uh, uh, profit from that. It, the rest of his land in Kentucky was gone. He had uh, uh, several hundred acres. He had a couple, well, 
several thousand acres in southern Indiana as part of the payment from Virginia for his military service. Uh, Cron owned more than 52,000 acres at his death. Uh, some of that from military service. Remember, he was a continental uh, major. And the rest of it was simple acquisition as uh, the deputy and then the principal surveyor for uh, Virginia's militia. Uh, surveyors got to the land first. And if uh, uh, the person who uh, was uh, eligible to receive the land chose not to, Cron simply bought it from them. Cron had patches of land in Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, and uh, was an extremely wealthy man. Uh, Mammoth Cave? Yes. There, Lucy's and, and William's son, John, who was a physician, bought Mammoth Cave in the, seven, in the 1830s. He thought it would be a great place to uh, begin a tuberculosis hospital because of the constant temperature and humidity. As it turned out, the, the five patients who went there uh, uh, died. And so they said, well, we've got this cave. And uh, he and his brother, uh, Colonel George Cron, uh, decided this might be interesting. And uh, in fact, George worked very hard to make sure that uh, Dixie Highway ran right by Mammoth Cave when it was built. And it did, of course, become one of the uh, major tourist attractions in the world. And they, the family kept it. John gave it to his nieces and nephews. The grand nieces finally sold it to the state who gave it to the federal government in the 1920s. Fantastic. Um, Olivia's got a question, a clarification for her. Uh, is Mulberry Hill the same property that was previously identified as Ant Hill and located no. in George Rogers Clark? Okay. No. Mulberry Hill uh, set, where, if you're familiar with Louisville, uh, it is this was at the site of today's uh, George Rogers Clark Park, straight across from Audubon Hospital uh, between Poplar Level Road and Preston. It right. fell down, was burned down uh, right around the beginning of World War I. Um, let's see, here's one that's just come in. I've yet to learn more about how the art of war applies to European settlement in America than by listening to Gwen Potts. I look forward to reading her book about Clark and Cron. Are republics really workable? This this question about the early <laughs> stages of uh, I don't of think the anybody can answer that right this minute. <laughs> As Ben Franklin says, a republic if we can keep it. That's right. Um, all right, I've got a fun one to close out on. Okay. Um, so a lot of uh, the characters that have appeared in this story have been recently redeemed in popular culture. Leslie Odom Jr. has given us a, a more positive Aaron Burr. Paul Giamatti has given us a more positive John Adams than anybody believed. Is there a, <laughs> is there a George Rogers Clark redemption on the horizon? I wish, I wish there were. I hope there is. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, historical figures come and go in terms of their popularity and their understanding, largely depending upon who's written about them or who's produced a fantastically successful Broadway play. And uh, I, I hope someday there is a, there's a Clark version uh, with both William and George Rogers and William Cron and all of these characters because, and Jonathan Clark, who was uh, an outstanding person in his own right. Um, th this is a, the, 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 the point of the book was the revolution in the West is not the revolution in the East. And while it doesn't get nearly the attention the revolution in the East received, of course, it nevertheless was critical to Washington's success for many reasons. And it is uh, probably uh, an overlooked period in uh, American history. And therefore the characters who surround it were also overlooked except maybe for James Wilkinson. <laughs> well, as a, as a Kentuckian, I think that's a perfect place to, uh, to leave it on a note of, uh, of okay. state pride. Thank you so much. For oh, you're welcome. Tonight. We've really enjoyed it. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.